right, everyone. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. I want to I want to thank you for taking your time to come to the uh, college hall faculty meeting to start the fall semester. I know that you always anticipate these with a great deal of excitement and always look for a reason to stop doing the work that you're doing so you can have a chance to come to the college faculty meeting. So know that that's also <laughs> recognized in, in, in uh, my gratitude for you actually doing that. Uh, but I, I do look forward to uh, expressing some exciting information today. I think that some of the topics we've been talking about, some of you know about, but I think that everyone will learn something new from the information that we'll be going through today uh, because there's a lot of stuff going on in the college that I would just describe as being uh, not only exciting, but I think some, some things that will be truly transformative to what it is that we're trying to accomplish with respect to our teaching, our research, uh, and our other activities uh, as a faculty in the College of Communication. So I'm tremendously excited about some of these things. Let me start, though, uh, by talking about some uh, things that I went back on my calendar and also in my emails and took note of going back just to the start of July. One of the things I, I try to do in preparation for this meeting is to just kind of go back and look at some of the events that have taken place that either I experienced uh, in my official or, in, or informal capacities as dean, uh, or that people have brought to my attention for various reasons. So I, I make no claim that this will be an exhaustive list of things, but there are just things that, that were brought onto my radar for various reasons. So in the month of July, um, the School of Journalism had their Journalism High School workshop. Uh, it's been going on for many decades. They had over 100 students from 11 different states and, and, and achieved at a very high level of training those students um, to understand not only uh, important skills as they learn to develop their skills as high school journalists, but they also obviously got a chance to experience Ohio University firsthand, uh, which I think was very exciting. Related to that, though, for the first time, the School of Media Arts and Studies launched a high school media workshop for high school students. They had approximately 50 students on campus. Is that about right? 56. Um, and one of the exciting things about that, because it was the first time that it had been launched, everything was started from anew. Uh, we had to do all the recruiting, all the planning for the workshop from scratch, um, and maybe getting advice from others, but all of the content um, happened from scratch. And I know that uh, the, the Media Arts and Studies faculty put a lot of thought into that, especially uh, Karen and Kyle, and so we really thank them for their leadership. And Drew, uh, when he was telling me about it in our meeting the other day, sounded almost like an athletic coach. I mean, he all but said that they had signed letters of intent from the students that attended that <laughs> workshop, and so I was very, very pleased to hear about that. And it was exciting if you were on campus at all over the summer in July, in between fire alarms going off and student over, <laughs> to have a chance to see the high school students working around the lobby inside Schoonover Center and in the various labs and walking back and forth uh, between uh, this building and Schoonover. I know that the two high school workshops had a mixer, which I thought was really novel and interesting um, and really applauded that. So I really love the fact that we're putting an effort into outreach to high school students. That's important to us for so many reasons, uh, not the least of which is that if we can get them on our campus and get to experience what our, our university students get to experience, I have no doubt that they're going to land many of those students uh, to become Bobcats in the future. At the same time, in July, another thing that I got to experience that was really exciting was the fact that WOUB and a communication studies faculty member in collaboration received an Emmy Award in Columbus in the regional Emmy celebration. And while I was there, not only did they receive that award, but I was able to witness um, many students that are media arts and studies majors and who work for WOUB that served as the crew for the media, uh, for the uh, uh, Emmy Awards celebration. And that was really exciting to see that because I was walking around in sort of this red carpet, black tie event, which I, I fit in really well on, I gotta tell you. Um, but then to see a student that I had seen in Spoonover and stop and talk to him about the fact that he's now working this very glamorous event and to see the excitement on his face, I thought that was really special um, and thought that was a great, a great showing of our university, not only because of the awards that we received, uh, but also because of the fact that our students were really the backbone of making that event um, so dynamic. If you fast forward just a few weeks in August, um, all of us remember and still continue to remember the events that happened in Missouri. And one of our alumni, Wes Lowry, um, you all probably know or you should know, was one of the reporters who were arrested in the McDonald's uh, that uh, happened uh, immediately after the riots started taking place. Um, and I was very proud, first of all, that one of our students was really leading the journalism that was happening in Missouri. And, and Wes, if you know him, has a very um, specific uh, expertise in how he uses social media and was really breaking a lot of 
great information through his Twitter uh, feed and other sources um, as he was as he was in Missouri. And when he was arrested, um, as you know, he became a national news headline. And of course, the journalism faculty stood up unanimous uh, uh, as a statement saying that they they you know did not agree with the fact that of course a journalist practicing their right to engage in journalism would be arrested by the authorities. So that happened in August. Also in August, um, fast forwarding a little bit later in the month, Meg Amasine, is, is that how you say her name? Meg Amasine. Um, she's a Scripps student uh, in the college, and she gave the opening remarks at the new freshman convocation after having gone through a contest to be able to be selected to give that speech. And so I got to witness that, as did all of the other incoming freshmen, of which I would add we had 532 approximately in that crowd. That's the number of freshmen that we brought in this year. And so that was an exciting event. Um, also in August, <clears throat> I had the chance to attend the AEJ conference in Montreal. Um, I like all academic conferences, they're always very energizing, and it was great to run into people that I knew at AEJ, uh, but maybe knew from a different point in life, uh, you know, when I was in graduate school and stuff, and they would come up to me and say, you know, your faculty and your students are really visible here. It's really great to see, you know, you representing Ohio University here to know that the faculty and the students you have do such great work. Um, and to get to see other people say that about our university is always something that's very enlightening. But while I was there, um, I was able to see Mary Rogus um, receive the Bliss Award for Outstanding Work in the Field of Broadcast Education. And that was really special because, uh, Mary, you're one of about two females that have received that award in about 50 years or something like that. It's so correct. we're really proud of <laughs> So while I was at the conference, I was able to see Mike Sweeney um, representing also Pat Washburn receive an outstanding monograph award in the history of journalism a group of AEJ. So that was really a special moment too. I don't think Mike's in here, but it's good for him. Great experience getting to see those things happen. If you fast forward a little bit later into September um, this month, things that I've that, that this really run across my desk in the last couple of weeks, there was an ITS graduate student, Satya Nukala. Is that right? That's right. Okay, Satya. Um, I, I was briefed by um, Hans um, that Satya received a award of accommodation from the dean of the Heritage College. Now, Satya is a graduate student that's doing. Uh, IT work for the Heritage College, but it's even more complicated than that. You probably know that the Heritage College is standing up or has stood up a new campus in Dublin, and my understanding is that Satya was very critical in helping to stand up the technology um, that enables them to do very significant distance education connections between Dublin and the Athens campus uh, to be able to deliver simultaneously curriculum to students in both locations. And so the Dean of the Heritage College gave Satya a Accommodation for the work that was performed to really make that happen. And, and so that was really exciting. It was also really special when Satya wrote back to me to say that um, he wanted to thank the ITS faculty, and especially Andy, um, for the mentoring that he's received while a graduate student in ITS. And so that was a great moment, I thought, as well. Um, also, just this week, uh, maybe it was over the weekend, actually, I found out that the Ohio University Society of Professional Journalists chapter received the National Chapter of Distinction Award. And the advisor of that is no, no other than the recent one, so congratulations. <laughs> and she was telling me about this award today in my office. She said, you know, if, if I just told you that we beat out Michigan, Michigan State, Ohio State, Marshall, uh, Pitt, uh, it, that would sound impressive, right? And I said, yeah, that would sound pretty impressive. She said, that's just the region that we beat. <laughs> you know, it doesn't include Northwestern or, or, or you know, any of the other schools on the coast. And so that was a really great moment. Um, and so we're really proud of the SB, SBJ chapter. Um, in addition to that, one of the things that I would point out, uh, if you weren't able to attend it, is that just uh, last week we did the launch of the Water Project. I know several of you were in the room for that, uh, but we launched the Water Project. And I'll talk about that more in just a minute. But that was a really special moment for the college. And a lot of people noticed that our college was out front and standing up about a very important social issue and doing so in a way that brings our expertise to bear on how we can inform and, and, and help others understand the relevance of that issue, not only in Southeast Ohio and in Athens, Ohio, but really across the entire state. In fact, it was announced officially today that the Water Project is engaged in a collaboration agreement with the Scripps network of broadcast outlets and digital outlets so that there is a free content sharing agreement between 
our organization and their organization. So it means that we're really playing on truly a national stage in terms of being able to not only disseminate, but also uh, bring together into a clearinghouse information about water and water quality issues in the state of Ohio. So I'm really excited about that. And I want to show you something from that website in just a moment. But before I get to that, um, there's a couple sort of observations I want to make about these lists of achievement. Number one, as I reflect back on that, it becomes pretty clear to me that as a college, our students and our faculty do outstanding work. Now, you've heard me say that before. You've heard Greg, you've heard Kathy, you've heard every dean has said that, right? But as I look back on this list of achievements, there's a couple things that stands out to me. We do so much great work, and I think we do far too little to let other people know about that great work, right? I think we have so many things that become feathers in the cap of the faculty and the students in the college, but we don't do very much to show those feathers off. And so one of the things that I want us to do as a college much more effectively this year is to look at achievements like these and try to figure out ways that we can be much more proactive, if not boring on aggressive, in getting information about those achievements out into media outlets and out into the public sphere so that others can understand the amount of excellent work that we did. So what's one of the ways we're gonna go about doing that? One of the commitments we made at the beginning of this year going into it is we're gonna to try to find some additional resources to put into our external communication wing in the college. It's not to replace what any of you do at the school level, but it's to bring some more resources to bear so that when you, when your students do outstanding work, we can figure out a way to try to get that out into the attention of others, because I think that's vitally important for us as a college of communication. So we asked Tim Sharp, who is sitting right over there, we asked Tim Sharp to take on a half-time role in the college office of directing a news bureau that is entirely focused internally about the work that we are doing in the college. He's in the process right now of hiring or trying to hire a couple of our students um, that would work in that news bureau, and their entire attention will be you and the work that you and your students are doing. And so, importantly, as things come up, it's vital that we get that information to Tim. And all you have to do to be able to do that is to contact him by email. You've already filled out a survey that starts to let him assess what some of the special areas of the faculty are. And he becomes our channel of information to be able to quickly get stories written and deployed in a way that not only appears on our website and our social media, but of course, we will also take a more active step of trying to push that out into the news media. Um, using our resources, including WUB, that can put you on national television if we can find that connection where it works out. So remember that Tim's here. Remember that Tim's job is to help publicize what it is that we're doing as a college. And as you do things, make sure you get that information to Tim. But also keep an eye on the national news cycle. So if there's something that happens where your scholarly expertise can be brought out to help uh, illuminate uh, that issue of the day, then certainly that's an opportunity also for you to contact him and say, you know, I'm an expert on this. I, I have something to say about what just happened. Um, we can pool our resources and try to figure out how to get you, um, if you're talking with executive producers nationally or, or locally or whatever, um, to try to get you into those stories. We actually have the ability through University Communication and Marketing to track media placements. Um, and so this is something we can actually look at as a college and see how, it, how are we doing in getting our faculty and our students out into the national uh, media's attention or any media's attention. Um, and we can track that and I think that's very exciting to do. So one observation was we need to do a better job of publicizing ourselves and that's one of the things that we're gonna start doing as a college. The second observation <clears throat> that I drew in looking at all of this is that when we talk about ourselves as a college, I think we've been, for lack of a better term, kind of fumbling around with that for so many years now. I know that when I was a faculty member and when I, when I first stepped into this office, we had been describing ourselves as a college of storytellers. But that, that's true, we are. We have many very good storytellers in the college. We have some of the best in the world, I think. Um, that doesn't capture all of us, though, right? I mean, there's a lot of us that would have to stretch a little bit in order to say that, what I practice is storytelling, right? So it doesn't capture all of us. I've also heard um, our faculty talked about um, as being faculty who are excellent, who achieve excellence in mentoring students, and that's true, we all do that, but it doesn't capture the totality of what it is that we do. We have outstanding teachers in this college, 
but of course we're so much more diverse in the skills that we bring to bear um, and, and the, the abilities that we bring to bear in our professional identities. It's, it's teaching, sure, but it's also so much more than that. So I felt for a number of years that we need to have a better way of talking about who we are as a college um, and how we expect to achieve that. So one of the dialogues that I want to open this semester with you um, and using the vehicle of the Dean's Advisory Council of, of elected faculty members to start that dialogue and not to end it there, um, is to think about ways that we can talk about the vision of what the Scripps College of Communication is. So as an opening salvo, um, maybe a straw person might be a better word for that, I want to show you how I've been playing around in a couple different venues now talking about the Scripps College of Communication. So <clears throat> a phrase that I've been using um, really for the entire summer in a couple different groups to talk about who we are in college is to call us a community of practice. And I, I don't want to go into a lot of detail about this right now, uh, just because we don't have enough time to. But the reason I'm drawn to this word is, is for a couple reasons. Number one, community of practice is actually a very specific term that has meaning behind it that stems from an educational philosophy of American pragmatism, specifically Dewey philosophies of American pragmatism. And what the philosophy of a community of practice is, is essentially this. It respects the notion that in a community you bring multiple people with diverse backgrounds together, and that all of those backgrounds should be respected as adding something meaningful to the outcome that is trying to be achieved. So diverse perspectives are all important, they all contribute, okay? So if we're a community of practice and communication, it means that we're trying to form a culture where we bring multiple perspectives, multiple viewpoints, diverse opinions together about the field of communication with the singular goal of improving practice in communication at a high level that we set for ourselves, which for us, we're a center of excellence, so it should be at an excellent level. Now, why is that so important? Well, if you start to think about us as a community, it means that it's much more than just what's in this room right now. It's not just the faculty, it's also the students that bring something to the table. And I think we would all say that we're better faculty members, we're better practitioners, we're probably, in many ways, better scholars because of the students that come in and out of our classrooms um, on a term by term basis. I think it also goes to speak to the fact that our college has a rich tradition of engaging people from the outside to come into Athens, Ohio, to be a part of our learning community. We, we regularly bring in alumni to speak to students. We regularly bring in scholars from other universities to do colloquia or to take part uh, in, in different types of research-oriented activities and, and professional-oriented activities that we're doing in the college. And so we are an inclusive college that opens our doors to people not just in Athens, but people really from around the world to be a part of our learning community. In fact, in just a week or so, we have a group of, of scholars from Leipzig that will be visiting campus and being a part of our community. <clears throat> and so the idea of community is one that I think really describes as well. What do I mean by practice? Now, you could easily reduce that to say that that's reducing things. But I think for us, if we think about the practices that we engage in, it really does run the gambit of being of being outstanding faculty members in the classroom, being outstanding faculty members in the way that we do research, creative activity, professional activity, and outstanding faculty members in the way that we perform service, not only to the university, but to the broader discipline, and even to the communities in which we live. And so that idea of practice, I think for us, is defined extremely broadly um, in all the different dimensions and layers that we perform on a daily basis as faculty members. And we make ourselves better at that. I think one of the things that we've done historically as a college is that we've nurtured each other in the way that we perform these activities. We do that through the annual report process. We do it through informal mentoring. We do it through the other ways that we support ourselves as teachers, scholars, etc. And so I think that that idea of practice is one that we engage in very well, have done that historically. And importantly, I think when we say to others, when we say to the Scripps Foundation, when we say to uh, partners in industry, when we say to our colleagues at other universities that we are a community of practice that expects to achieve excellence, it's pretty easy to talk about the different dimensions of that, I think, and to talk about our college with the breadth, but also the depth that it deserves uh, because of the history of what it is that we've accomplished and continue to accomplish. So, I want you to ruminate on that. I want you to think about that phrase. And what I want to be able to do over the course of the semester 
is to get more meaning to what some of those words might mean in the context of our college. This is not meant as a branding statement. It's not meant as something that we're going to put in front of a high school senior, but it's meant as a way for us to think about who we are. And for me, has been something that's been very informative. And I hope that as and I hope that it will be for you too. And if it's not, then I hope we figure out a way to make something work where we can all say this is who we are, because I think you've lacked that for a while now. Okay. Unfortunately, that was just the introduction. <laughs> so now, now we turn to the content of the presentation, but some of this we'll go through uh, rather quickly. I want to talk first really quickly about the, the water project. Um, I think the water project, if it pans out the way that it should pan out, given the expertise that we brought to bear, will be one of the moments in the college that will be as significant as the opening of Schoonover. I think it's that important that we are. Now, why do I say that? The water project, I think, is very special for us because it's one of the few, it's one of the few things that we've done as a college where you can nearly point to every single discipline represented in the college and say they were a part of that. Um, it's one of the few times in the history of the college where not only do we bring all of the academic units together, the WUB has and will continue to play a central role in making this project achieve success. So really, what I'm saying is the totality of the college is represented and it's at such a high level and will have such a high impact, I think we will look back on this and say this was a, a major, a, a significant event in the history of the College of Communication. Now, um, why do I say that? I, I want to show you just one very short video, and I know that some of you were at the launch event and you saw this video, but I want to show you one example of the type of narrative that is on this website. And then I want to encourage you to go to the website and look at the other types of information because it really spans from the very factual database type of information that you would expect on a, on a database website all the way to the very rich and narrative-oriented information that you would expect on something much more entertainment-oriented. What we're going to look at really quickly is one of those narratives. And as you're watching this, I want you to keep in mind this was done by our students. And also to keep in mind that there was no um, scripting that went into this. This was simply a documentary work. And as you listen to the woman uh, tell the story of who she is, I think you'll be really impressed with her as a really poetic person. Yeah. 
minute to say here. Let's turn back now. I had no clue about fear until I got on the water. So all the things I was afraid of losing, you know, I found out that wasn't the hard part. All this newness, this no control of the wife. <laughs> the buoyancy of being on the roof, knowing you're constantly moving, even in your It's uh, OUWaterProject.org. OUWaterProject.org. So I really want to encourage you to go there. We're entering the next generation planning for this uh, project, and, and the way that it's first happening is substantively where the School of Information Telecommunication Systems is going to have conversations about how smart sensor networks can be integrated into the water project. We will also have scholars from the Rust College of Engineering who work on liquid dynamics will become part of it. Um, and, and so the exciting thing about this is how it integrates so many different people, but yet the Scripps College of Communication is entirely in um, And I think this will become a template for other types of projects like this um, that we will be able to do as a college that really demonstrates the, the scope and the impact that we can have as faculty members and students in the field of communication. So very excited about it and know that I think we should all be very proud of what the water project is in its current state and also be very excited about how it's going to evolve uh, to include community dialogues that will be led by people in communication studies. So I'm very excited about this project in a way that is simple. Okay, so uh, to, to start moving forward in some of the, uh, the, the more meaty topics uh, that you would typically expect in a all faculty meeting, um, so the first topic that I'd like to talk about with respect to that uh, is building. I was going to give you some quick updates on it. Um, you can walk around and see probably as much uh, now inside Schoonover as I'm going to be able to tell you about. But to start with, we already have some completion of phase two done. So the pictures you're seeing right here are of the School of Information Telecommunication Systems labs, which are in the basement. Um, you can actually go down into the basement if you out the appropriate stairwell to <laughs> actually see this. And so I encourage you to do that. Um, you'll notice that they have a, a very large instructional space here with artwork at, and Legos. And um, this instructional space is fantastic. I, I got to tour it in today's state, that picture's from today. <laughs> and it's, it's more set up than it was when I saw it previously with boxes and stuff. But you get to see what it looks like. And the lower right hand corner is their data farm. Uh, their server farm that is, is connected to the labs um, that, that just looks really high tech is about all I can say about it, right? So it's the IP any for uh, techno people on the line to see that. Very impressive space, and it's up, running, um, and I think it's going to be interesting the way that ITS is developing a philosophy about how each of the different parts of the lab will have a different feel to it to generate a different type of sort of emotional experience with people that are in those labs. Um, maybe you guys wouldn't use emotional bit. You get the idea, right? Another space that went online is a new equipment room for the college where we're consolidating um, all of the equipment into one space. And so the equipment room uh, got stood up uh, about a month or so ago, um, and this really uh, consolidates some of the work that we've been duplicating across several schools uh, in WWD and puts it into one operation. Uh, so that space opened up. It'll be temporarily there and then we'll move once we get to the latter parts of the second phase. And then the School of Media Arts and Studies uh, also recently opened up uh, one of their labs that they've been teaching out of. And so this is up on the third floor um, that you can also go up and take a look at. Now I show those to you for a couple of reasons. Number one, 
you can see tangible evidence that phase two is moving along uh, and getting things accomplished. I'm going to show you some dates here in just a second to give you an idea of when things will get done. But the real reason I wanted to show you those pictures is that as faculty members, you can start to envision what your instructional spaces inside Schoonover will look like and what they will feel like. And one of the things that, that Hans and I were sort of bouncing ideas back and forth with each other about today is that perhaps later in the semester, we will figure out some time for they and media arts and studies to do an open house so that just faculty members can walk around and look at these spaces, see some of the technology that's in there and how it operates, so that you start to get a feel of what your classrooms will be like when you teach on RTV and in Schoonover in the coming year. So this space looks great. We're really proud of it. So some dates that are important to you. Um, right now, we're in what I would consider to be the first part of the primary second phase. So student number one is the second phase of the project at the very beginning of it, the first part of it. And then there are some other parts of the second phase. So there's the part that deals with scripts hall and there's the second part of the second phase of Scudo. It's very delicate in how they're structuring this because, because it impacts our ability to teach classes that they don't sequence it in a very particular um, uh, way of, of, of doing things. So, the main part of Schoonover, which includes all of the office space, so that means the office space for the three uh, schools that have not yet moved in. Uh, it includes most of the instructional space, like the auditorium, the collaborative boarding classroom, uh, and things like that. That is taking place right now and will go until about March of 2014, which actually, as I look back on notes from previous years, um, was approximately the date that Greg Shepard said we would be done with the project. If you can believe that, right? Mm -hmm. But if it should be 15, sorry, yeah, we didn't go backwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the same thing is true for RTV, that it, it goes from September until about March of uh, 2015. Um, and in fact, if you walk through the buildings right now, you see that they're in the demolition phase. There's already very noticeable progress on this. Scripps Hall is also undergoing the same demolition phase. And in fact, we're in apparently one of the few rooms that you can still enter into in this building because the others are poured onto the contractor store for keys. Um, this building will be going until September of 2015 um, as well. Parts of it will be done before then, but because of roofing and things will be going on, this building will actually not become fully functional until the very beginning of the school year next year. And then the second part of phase two, which is a small part of it that includes things like the Leon Harris Student Center that will be in the lobby, the Welcome Center, some mechanical things that are actually on the top of our TV uh, in reality uh, will not happen until um, post-September 2015, uh, but that won't for the most part, impact all of you. Uh, there will still be some construction going on in the lobby, but you will be in your office as well for that. Now, <clears throat> the question you might have is, when will I be able to move into my new office? And the best that we can project right now is that your office suites for comms, ITS, and VICO will be done in you know approximately March of 2014. This contractor is not like the previous contractor, so I've got pretty good faith that they're going to stay uh, on schedule. I don't anticipate that they'll have nearly the surprises, not only given their confidence, but also the type of work that they're doing is pretty predictable at this stage. So I think that's a good timeline, very likely. But I think that um, the way we're thinking right now, and I think you probably would agree with me, is that it makes a lot of sense to just plan on that move happening at the end of the semester in the spring, um, rather than trying to move you like right after spring break or certainly in the middle um, of what is a very busy time for all of us in the college and your students. So <coughs> in terms of that move, I think it's going to happen at the end of the year, uh, but there's no reason that it shouldn't happen directly at the end of the year so that you have the entire summer to get, you know, get your office exactly how you want it. Related to that, there will be meetings scheduled for each of the faculty members um, in the three remaining schools where you will sit down with the university designer to go through how you want your office to be set up. There, there is a good deal of options that exist in how you want it laid out, what types of um, furniture treatments you want in your office. Uh, I don't want to make it sound like you need to go to the furniture store and buy a bunch of stuff, but there is a good deal of options that you have. And so you should be thinking about answering this question before you go into that meeting. How do I like to work? And that may not be the current office that you're in, right? Your, your current office may be horrible for how you like to work. But you need to think about how you like to work because what Lynette and her staff will do is to try to help 
build the furniture around your work style. So if you're a person that loves a lot of books, you need a lot of bookshelves. If you're a person that likes to be able to stand at your desk, which I know we have some of those in the college, then they need to know that so they can order a desk that has adjustable height and, and things like that. Those issues will take place during a personal one-on-one -on -one session where you get to um, give some feedback about your office and how it will be set um, So the projected movement date will be at the end of the spring semester. I wanted to show you one other quick uh, set of data about the building that, that I've asked the directors to start giving some attention to that I think is really important to us. So we actually have two brand new large spaces that will go online for the college at the start of the next academic year. So the start of next year, a year from right now, we will have the auditorium and student over. We will also have the active learning classroom on the fourth floor of student over. And we still have this room right here, right? So, so we have these spaces. <coughs> and one of the things that we need to understand and have no control to change is that those spaces, by virtue of the fact that they are over 99 students, are spaces that the registrar controls. Now, we get first priority on those. So if we want to fill those spaces up, we will be able to do that. We wouldn't be at risk of having to go to board if we didn't want to um, if there was availability in our spaces. But when we were doing some analysis, when I was doing some analysis um, last week, I, I wanted to figure out how many courses are we actually teaching that fits the size point of these classes? And the answer is actually that we're not teaching very many. I mean, we are teaching several, but it's only about 50% of the time blocks that would be available in these rooms um, that we're teaching currently, okay? So why is that important? Well, if we took all the classes that we were teaching that could fit into these rooms and plugged them in, about half of the time slots available for those rooms would still be open, okay? Now, the reason why that should bother us a little bit is that that means that any other class in the university that fits that size point could be placed into the class. And I think that the worry that we have is that other people will not take care of our home as well as we take care of them, right? So I think one of the things we should think about as a faculty is what is our commitment to try to make sure that other units do not utilize our space? And if that commitment is strong, then that means we should think about ways to position our classes to fit into those units. Don't under RCM, don't they have to pay us for the space? No. But we paid less, don't we? we well, we don't, we don't have to pay for the, we don't have to pay for the projector when it has to be replaced. And we don't have to pay no, but don't like they that. have to rent? No, they do not pay us for the space. So the university registrar gets to control that space and schedule into it, and we have no control. So one of the things I want us to think about is how we can create classes at the size points that will fit into these rooms, uh, and to do so in a way that you know achieves our goal of trying to make sure that we have the primary utilization of the spaces. It, it wouldn't it wouldn't serve us well if we created these spaces and then used them 50 percent or less of the time. Um, it would show that we Okay. Um, yeah. Is that Anderson? Is that the? Well, that's this one. This is Anderson. So then, is the one thirty-five? Is that the one around? Uh, the fourth floor classroom is the library classroom. The retreat comes in at about hundred students. Okay. Uh, any other questions about the building before we move on? When the, when this class when these classroom spaces are available. Who's going to be the person in the college? Because you know there are five schools, and we all can't have the classroom at the same time. That right. So, so the registrar is the person who technically controls that, just like they always have. So what we need to do in the college is to develop sort of a preliminary shadow system to know who wants to be able to use the room at what time. This is how they do it in. Uh, in uh, uh, arts and sciences, where uh, a butcher is her last name, I can't remember her name now. She manages the, the big classrooms at Morton from an informal standpoint, and then she hands that over to the registrar. So what we need to do as a college, for these three spaces where we don't have direct control over them, or we, we don't have as much control, we need to keep a shadow system during the scheduling process to say that uh, you know, the journalism class wants to try to have the class during this time period and then reconcile all of that and then turn that over to the registrar's office so that they can plug those spaces in uh, when the scheduling is occurring uh, for each of the 
first semester. So, so what we need to do in the college office is have a shadowing system. Um, we've talked to a couple people about being the manager of that, of that shadowing system. We haven't had a need for it right now, so we'll have to rekindle that discussion, but that's what we'll do at the college level is to run that shadow system. So, Scott, I have a question about um, teaching technology in there. You know, in this building, we outfitted all the classrooms with Macs because that's what we're teaching in labs. And I've got kind of a bad reputation on campus for not letting other departments use these computers, but they were bought by our students, basically. So anybody in the college can use them. We're, we're happy to give the passwords and usernames and all that to anybody in the college who's teaching here, but not outsiders. And I'm wondering, do you know who's going to equip we're the ones driving that train, so you know um, it's not the registrar's office or OIT that's dictating what the technology is that's going into the auditorium and the active learning classroom. In fact, the active learning classroom is so unique that they wouldn't be able to even grant the subcontract, just the planning of that out. Um, Ricky's really leading this for the college and saying in these classrooms we need to have these capabilities, and in fact, he's had, Ricky is having a meeting with uh, iVideo which is the firm that does this high-end uh, uh, treatment, technology treatment in the room. He's meeting with them uh, on Monday, if not today, as you know, right, right in proximity right now, um, to talk about the auditorium specifically. And so we're driving that selection process, Bob, which leads me to think that we'll, we'll have a good deal of control over how that technology operates and how we control it. Now, like this room, we will have to provide a capability for instructors to come in and utilize the projection and that sort of right. thing. But you know, it's using a laptop and an umbilical like I'm doing right now. So, um, and for the most part, with the exception, I think, of one person from outside the college has been using this room. We haven't gotten complaints enough that we've had to really refute that at all. So, people are kind of okay with that. Anything else about the building? Okay, we'll keep you updated mostly through the building committee about this. Uh, Tom is still leading this charge for us, and we should thank him every day to see him for doing that. Um, and uh, but, but he's already got a house bought in North Carolina to retire to when the building's done. So, um, but he'll keep the building committee informed, and he'll keep the directors informed about anything happening with the building. But I really do think it's, it's for the most part, not right now. So in terms of advising, um, I, I bring these slides to your attention because of a university initiative that I'll talk about in just a moment. But before I get to that university initiative, I wanted to talk about some of the things that I have looked into regarding advising in preparation for that initiative that I thought you would find interesting. First of all, this, this university initiative is focused on freshmen. So I asked the question of the directors, what's, our, what's the freshman strategy in your school? And I won't go into these uh, at all, but these were some of the responses. And if I slightly mischaracterized the school, I apologize uh, in the way that I wrote it. But I, I think that's fairly accurate. And this just goes to say that when I spoke into this to Elizabeth Sears, the new university college dean, I, I was able to say, we have a deliberate advising strategy that's not uniform across the college, nor do I think it should be, but we do have deliberate strategies in place for advising our freshmen, which I think is a good thing that our colleges had more thought to do that. Now, I think that there are some schools that have, have, have developed a bit more deliberate strategies than others, and so there's still ways that we can, I think, assess what we're doing and improve it, but for the most part, I think we have a very sound advising approach in college, and of course, we've been known for excellence in advising for so long. In fact, statistically, you can make an argument that we're probably one of the best colleges on campus. The first set of statistics I would point to is our freshman retention rate, which as you can see, although it's dipped slightly, it's done so in a way that mirrors the university dip. Uh, and of course, we're well above our peers uh, as a whole across the university in terms of uh, uh, freshman retention. In fact, Elizabeth Sears, when she met with me to talk about this issue, she explicitly said, y'all are doing pretty good. There's probably not a lot more you're going to be able to do to push that number up. Um, not that you shouldn't try, but that's really probably as close to a ceiling as you're going to get, um, recognizing that we were higher a few years earlier. So that number is something we should all be very proud of. Another set of numbers that I think you'll find interesting, um, and maybe you've not seen before, Institutional Research does a survey of alumni every year. Um, and so these, these, these years do not represent the 
year in which the survey was done, they represent the cohort year. So the survey for the cohort year 2000 um, was conducted much later than that. So the most recent cohort to have reported in on the survey was the cohort that entered in the year 2005. Um, as you look at these values, what they suggest and, and represent is the fact that our extremely and very satisfied ratings of advising has steadily increased um, uh, over the course of those cohorts. Um, the number of people that were not satisfied has steadily decreased over the course of those cohorts. And the satisfied is sort of also a decrease, but I think that could be a reflection of satisfied people becoming extremely satisfied and that sort of thing. So these statistics tell me that not only are our retention rates illustrative of the fact that we do great advising, but in fact the students say that we do great advising. So um, if you look at the advising that we do in the college, I think we should all be very proud of it. But that said, um, I think there's always ways to look for improvement. And so one of the opportunities that presented itself uh, was that the provost uh, I think probably at the request of David Discutner as he was stepping out as uh, Dean of the University College, the provost made a decision to provide funding for three years to hire advisors that will be placed in academic units across campus. So right now, University College is undertaking a movement to hire a cohort of seven advisors, one of which will be placed in each of the colleges. Now what's the role of that advisor? Um, that person, um, first of all, it's important to understand they are not an employee of the college they're placed in. Much like our instructional designer that we have right now and our HR guy, Adam, that we have right now, they are placed physically in our college and do work for the college, but their direct reporting line is to a simple unit. In this case, it is the Allen um, Help Center that is in Baker Center. Uh, this advisor is explicitly not intended to replace faculty advising. It is intended to supplement that. And the way that it can supplement, the way that that person can supplement faculty advising is in many different ways, but it essentially comes down to the fact that that person can be assigned a load of undergraduate advisees that would likely be at the freshman or entry level status of students. So it may be a sophomore that transferred into the college. They so they can be assigned advisees, and that person would also work on targeted areas of retention, which for us could mean probation students, but frankly we don't have very many, and we already do that as a college, we already advise those students. We're actually, in talking with Elizabeth, probably going to target students we call in the muddy middle, where their GPA is between 2.0 and 3.0, so they're not on probation, but they're also not excelling at the level that they probably could be. So we're looking at that murky middle as our target of advising rather than the probation students. So we're going to get this resource. We get it without having to pay for it, at least for the first three years. Then we might be asked to pay for it after that. And what we're going to try to do over, you know, really the next several weeks is to figure out the best way to utilize that resource. Um, we don't, uh, we're, we're not the people responsible for hiring that person university colleges, um, and so we get some say in that, just like we did with the course designer and the HR person, uh, but really the opportunity that we have is that we can get some advising help <clears throat> that will not replace what you're doing, but it can certainly, for some faculty, maybe potentially help them out, but more importantly, provide a new resource for us doing um, even a better job with our students, which is always a good thing. Questions about that for everyone? Um, well, the answer is yes, because they're going to be the advisory communication. So the question is really how much will they know? Um, but it depends. I mean, the initial people that are hired could very well be from, um, you know, units on campus that are dealing with communication in some way. Um, it, it's impossible to know any of them. That's true for us at the college. But the, the idea is, is that if we get them hired now, have an advising period during which they can train um, and get to know what they need to know in order to be able to advise in the spring more directly. And also remember that while it is important for them to understand our majors, the primary role of this person will be advising students whose major task is to accomplish the tiers and you know tier one and tier two requirements and then transition them to an advisor that has much more substantive expertise. 
this will not be true for all, all programs across the college. In fact, it might be some targeted use of this person um, in, in certain areas that they can specialize a little bit more. So, so you're asking a really good question. We have our eyeball on that. And of course, if we can hire somebody that has knowledge of, the, of, of our college, that would be great. But if not, um, you know, Beth will be in charge of figuring out how to train that person best so that when they do take on those entry-level students, they'll have a plan for how to do that. Um, next topic, I want to talk briefly about Celio. How many of you have heard about Celio already? Very good. Most, most of you. All right. So the backstory on this is that all of you should know that we are an accredited institution. That's good. It's probably one of the reasons why we all have jobs. Um, but to remain accredited, you have to go through a reaccreditation process. For many institutions, that's very similar to a seven-year cycle like the departmental school level at Ohio University where accreditation teams come in every seven or so years and do an institution-wide site visit. For Ohio University, however, that's not the format they use. They use a process called AQIP or, uh, that represents continuous quality improvement. So we do not have the same type of site visits, uh, but we do have periodic evaluations. Well, for many cycles of those periodic evaluations, it has been pointed out to us that Ohio University has a distinctive opportunity to start doing better at assessment. That's their way of saying we're not doing it at all. And so, now with the exception of accredited programs, they, they recognize that accredited programs are doing assessment. Most of the rest of the university is doing nothing related to that. So, last year, um, a little bit after this point in the year, we were told by uh, Mike Williford that we were going to have to start upping our game in assessment, not just the Scripps College, every college in school that. And so I immediately started thinking about what are some options that we have for assessment. We started asking directors um, what it is that we're doing at the school level for assessment. And um, so at that point, I was in an information gathering stage. And as the, the semester went along, um, I started to become more and more convinced that some sort of a portfolio setup is one that would fit our field extremely well uh, in the way that it would allow our students to demonstrate competencies across several areas. But I didn't have a solution for that. And in fact, I had talked with uh, Bob because journalism had considered a portfolio previously, but the mechanics of it uh, made it seem prohibitive at that time. So all that goes to say that portfolios as an idea for assessment was on my radar, but the mechanism, uh, we didn't have a good mechanism in place, so that's as far as it went. About that time, <clears throat> I started to see mention of, C of Celio in my news feeds at night, and then one of their uh, campus representatives actually contacted us and had meetings with us um, right in the December, January timeframes when those started. And the more we learned about Celio, the more it became very obvious that this not only presented a solution for us with respect to assessment, but actually, much more importantly, it presented a solution for several other things. It lets students have a platform for using the works that they create to present a professional digital identity of themselves that's not like LinkedIn, that's very flat and static. It's not like Facebook that is very not flat and not static, but maybe not all that appropriate. It's somewhere in the middle between those spaces that has the look and feel of social media, but is really a professional portfolio that a student can use as they go onto the job market or apply for graduate school or apply for an internship. And that was very exciting to me because then it was much more about the student and how they would benefit from having this device or this tool rather than it being just about being a portfolio, which most of those platforms uh, look about as exciting as LinkedIn, from my perspective. <clears throat> as we learn more about Celio, um, not only do we see that benefit of the students having a great tool at their fingertips, but as we learn more about it, we also understood that Celio could be used by the college and by the schools as a way to curate examples of students' work that we would want to show others, right? So from a communication standpoint, we do all this fantastic work our students do in the classes, but rarely, with a few notable exceptions, do we have the opportunity to take that work and show it to other people. And with Celio, 
it sort of is built to do that. It's built so that you're able to selectively curate the best work of students and, and, and show it to the world, um, either by embedding it in another website or by using some built-in tools that Celio has and just linking to those. And so that became very exciting. Now, you're going to ask a question about privacy, and I'll talk to you about that in just a moment. But let me quickly um, talk about some of the features related to Celio. But I, but I will go through this rather quickly because Ultimately, this is the type of thing like Facebook or like LinkedIn that you should just play with to really understand how it works. Um, so in terms of Celio, some benefits for the students, is, and I think the key one out there, is that um, they are able to document through the works they put in Celio what they did as students. And I think that's one of the things that our students don't do a great job of is talking about when they took John Hope's class you know, what the thing was that they did in there when you asked them that question three years later, right? And so this lets them have a record of what the things were that they did in a class, but that record is not just for their internal consumption. They would be able to show that to someone else. And I think that's very exciting. So the benefit of the student, I think, is that, that ability to have a portfolio that can be used for multiple purposes. For the, for the faculty, I think there are also benefits. Um, obviously, we can use this as an assessment tool. We will do that. And I think that based upon how the other deans are watching us, there are several other colleges that are interested in seeing how we do this because they want to use it. In fact, University College is now planning on using Celio for their BSS degree uh, if, if they can get the deal worked out. So I think that there's a benefit for us from an assessment standpoint. But I think there's other benefits for you as a faculty member. Um, just a couple that I thought of is that you're able to um, showcase your classroom to others. So if you go to a professional conference where you're talking about your pedagogy, this is a way that you would be able to have a platform uh, in showing that. <clears throat> but even as a teaching tool, if you teach a class multiple times, which I think most of us do, think about the fact that you would be able to go back into previous semesters and to be able to say to a current class, I want you to look at the project done by student X three years ago because it really illustrates the way that you can use composition for an outdoor photography shot. Um, so I think that's something that you as a teacher can use as a very valuable teaching tool. Now you might already do that, but that's pretty manual as a process to, to keep that information and then be able to use it um, as a teaching tool. Um, so this becomes something as a way for you also to keep track of your information. So this works through an architecture of portfolios. So a student creates a portfolio. This is what a portfolio looks like. I won't go into a lot of detail, but it has a short biography of the person. This is actually one of our students that has created a portfolio. Um, we had a team of about 10 students that uh, worked with Celio in the spring to create just a quick initial version of a portfolio for themselves. They spent what, about an hour and a half or something like that. And they ended up having you know, stuff that looked like they'd spent hours on it. It's that easy to use. It's that easy to load stuff into. Um, and, and you can see that the works that are put into it, so the portfolios contain works, the works that are put into it are able to show examples of products, but it also has narrative about the product. So from an assessment standpoint, I can not only look at the, the product that's placed up there, it might be a picture, but it can also just as easily be a word file that is a paper that a graduate student in a graduate seminar, the product is up there, but there's also an opportunity for the student to be self-reflective about that product. And if you do very much reading about sort of the trends in assessment, the best practice of assessment now is to not have others be the only people giving summative feedback on how a student is doing, but rather to also have the student become self-reflective about their own work. And this is a tool that specifically hooks that into the platform. Um, it is. Um, one of the things I want to tell you about privacy is that um, unlike Facebook, anytime a work is uploaded into Celio, you have absolute control over who is able to see that. And um, I won't you know, go into all the details, but you're able to say, this work that I'm putting up, I don't want it to be public to anyone yet. I, I want it to be up there so I can keep a record of it and have it for my own you know, record, but I don't want anyone else to ever be able to see it. Or you can put a work up and say, I only really want people in my class to be able to see this, if that's, if that's a group that you belong to. Or you can make it publicly available to everyone. You can also, let's say you're a freshman, and you do that outstanding work that all freshmen do, right? You put that into your Celio portfolio, 
Um, and maybe by the time you're a senior and you're applying for jobs, you don't really want people to be able to look back at your freshman work. You want to highlight the more recent stuff that is perhaps and presumably of much higher quality. Well, then you can go back and retroactively change the privacy setting so that you don't lose it, but that it's no longer public and they're no longer accessible. Uh, the answer is yes to both questions, so this is entirely cloud-based. Um, we do have a contract with them. Um, it's something we had to get in the battle with OIT over when we won that battle. Um, and so we have this as a contract. Um, you're probably now thinking this question is, if they ever end that contract, will this go away? And the answer is no. So the contract, we're really, we're really paying for the consultancy around using CBO. So they will come and sit with you in your classroom and help you train your students like that in this contract. The software platform itself, our students and you as faculty members now have access to, unless Celio folds, which I think is not very likely, but it's there forever. Okay. You can access it no matter if you're still speaking or not. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, you'll, as a student, you would remain in the Scripps College of Communication group after you graduate, um, but you could continue, I mean, a professional that's been out in 10 years could as their professional portfolio if so much. So the users, I, neither we nor the person ever pays to be a user of CBO. That's not the way the business works. Yeah. So how does the portfolio define? Is it defined by the instructor or by the student? It's just defined by the student. How does quality control the actual information? Um, I'll, I'll answer that, but I think that this is something that's a much deeper conversation than Beth and, and people that will be working on the assessment component of this even quite more. But the quick answer to the question is, we as faculty members need to start thinking about assessment as we're teaching. Now, we all grade, we all get grades, but I think we all know that that's not what we mean when we talk about academic assessment. We're talking about how students perform in relation to outcome learning objectives. And so if I, for example, assign an activity in my class, then I might very well, both in the syllabus, on the assignment sheet, and orally during class say, when your group does the YouTube video and upload it for the assignment, you should also link it into your Celio portfolios and tag this as digital media. Okay. That statement in and of itself is directions then that will eventually let us as faculty members go in and look at a portfolio of collection of, you know, a collection of items that relate to digital media, and then we can assess how well the students were able to, you know, it, uh, represent skills that we thought were important. So there's a lot of there's a lot of detail in there that I'm leaving out, obviously, but it starts with the instructor saying, here's how this assignment should be thought of in relation to outcome learning objectives now should be tagged in Celio and make sure the students know to do that. Now that doesn't prevent a student from using a work in another class, let's say that they're taking an English class, does not prevent them from also using a work in that class to say that it relates to um, oral communication because they gave a presentation, they could do that. And then there might be an issue of quality control, but as, as I've thought about it, you know, if a student tags that and says that it's oral communication, I look back and go, not the way we've ever taught it. That in and of itself is important, right? Because they're not transferring that knowledge from a public speaking class to an English class. So the, the very short, quick, and dirty answer to your question, Trevor, is that I think we as the faculty have to start guiding that quality control through how we are directed to students with respect to the activities and the assignments we already do in our courses and how they would feed into a portfolio. If we do that, I think that solves a lot of the problems. Um, but I think that as students learn more and more how to use it, we also have to recognize that this is their portfolio and how they choose to create it. You know, it's not like you and I have editorial control over that. But at the end of the day, that's informative for us to still be able to look at that.
also so that I can be evaluated. Do I have to create a CEO portfolio for myself? We as faculty have to do this. Is that how we're going to be assessed? No. Like I'm wondering about um, So let so me back up and go back to it. I've created a CEO account because if I'm going to talk to a student about how they can use it, I should understand how to use it myself. It's about like using Facebook. So in terms of the things that you do with it and how you interact with it, it's very similar to Facebook in that sense. So it's not it's not Blackboard. Say, but, but Facebook is not a strong, uh, it's not, that it's like Facebook is not a strong seller. Well, I, I understand that, but I'm just trying to give you a calibrated level of type of interactivity with it. Um, are you required to use it at ID? That's really a conversation for you and your faculty. They have because it's something that you have to understand how to use it. Yeah, that's really good. 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 Yeah, that's really question about that, but it seems to me that the question of are your students learning what you say that they're learning, that's really more something that you as a faculty have to care about. So then that question of whether or not you should be using Celio is a question that you should be having with your colleagues. Um, that's the tool that the college is invested in to allow us to do it. So, you know, if your class is not represented in Celio, is that the end of this being able to work? Probably not. But does that mean then that communication studies is not able to demonstrate that students are achieving outcomes at a certain level in a particular skill that maybe when you're teaching? That might be an implication, right? A lot of that depends on what the school's learning outcomes are, how your course fits into that, and those sorts of things. And then the last thing I would say is I, I completely get the fact that there are going to be faculty in this room, certainly, um, that don't want to have to deal with it, right? You don't like Blackboard, you don't like this other stuff. That's one of the reasons why we have the contract with Celio is that if you don't want to deal with it as a faculty member, but as a whole, the faculty in your school says, yeah, Austin, that's something that we do need to assess, then let's have the Celio team come in and help guide the students on a one-on-one -on -one basis if necessary with your you know, knowledge and oversight and then let them help us accomplish the situation. If this was so important, why is it being presented to us now? Well, to my role as an academic officer is to say that we are going to assess our students' learning. It's also the role of the university administration to say that. And by the way, it's not just us. It's our accrediting body that says that. Right? I'm not just feeling the need to, to assess by any means, but I, I think it's an interesting um, challenge uh, to assume that uh, those of us who are doing instruction Well, above and beyond assessment, it became a no-brainer. 
Yeah. I'd also say that uh, the directors had many opportunities to talk about this. This wasn't something Scott did without consulting the director. So every director, you know, heard about this and was asked our opinion. Um, so I just want to make sure everybody knows. We also knows had that. a small faculty group. Uh, Amy was there. Josh was there. So we did involve. Um, Beckley as well to make sure that the implementation, and if I could just build really quickly because I know we're out of time, but we also um, have made sure, I think this kind of gets to Austin's point a little bit, we've made sure that this is incorporated with faculty and freshman classes so that our freshmen are starting to use this and understand it as well. So there's upper level classes. There isn't going to be the idea that you are going to have instruct students on the but more the idea that it gives students an outlet as they um, come into these upper level classes and they find work that they think is appropriate. Um, there is also the ability to um, add work for individual classes. So for instance, in our learning communities, um, we each have a Celia class and students can add work and then we can show a whole portfolio of work just for that class, but that work also goes into their personal portfolio. So in that way, we're looking at kind of class outcomes, but also just the student outcomes on an individual basis. Yeah, thanks. Right. So, so there are faculty that have already used this, so um, certainly those people can become resources. But again, we pay for CLA to come to Athens, and so um, that's part of their business model. That they will come and spend as much time with us as we request. And so as more faculty start using it, that certainly becomes an option that we're trying to train from the ground up. And so by the time a freshman gets into your classes, chances are pretty good they've already used CLEO several times by that <coughs> Okay, um, let me then, I've already talked about the external communication component. Um, let's switch gears now and talk about university innovation. And I apologize for the fact that we're not going to be able to spend as much time on this as I'd like. And Michelle, let me talk about the university stuff that I'll try to you. So if you read the announcements about the university innovation strategy, um, you know that there was a report released by a consultant. The stage at which we are at right now is to have until October 20th to provide feedback to Joe Shields about the substance of that report so that what is an interim report can be turned into a final report. Let me just quickly give you the headline that I think is important. As the deans were trying to help the consultant brainstorm how to put together sort of an initial possible structure for innovation activities that we invested in, um, it took about a year. I mean, it took a long time, and we were under an embargo to not talk about this publicly, and so it would have been great if everybody would have been involved, like Vision Ohio, maybe not, maybe that would be a joke, right? But <laughs> the way that they chose to do it, because the consultant was driving it, was to have the deans provide feedback based upon their information to come up with an initial framework for dialogue. <clears throat> the idea now is to make that become public so that the public side of that discussion can take place, right? So during that year-long process of coming up with these four portfolios, I really viewed my role in those meetings as trying to stake out territory for our college so that as this moved into a phase where there would be opportunities for funding, that we would have plenty of territory through which we would have opportunities to apply for that funding. Um, and so this is sort of the way that it worked out. If you look through the document that I sent out, you know that the four portfolios were subdivided into sub-portfolios, and those sub-portfolios were subdivided into niches. As I go through all of those and look at the places where we directly and indirectly connect to those niches, um, it looks to me like there's about 75% of them that we have pretty strong arguments so I just want to tell you, I think that we're really well represented in this. There might be other colleges that don't, although I think every dean that was sitting around the table felt like they got a fair shake on this. I think we came out very well, uh, and there's just no other way to say that. So we have a tremendous amount of opportunity. We can't reasonably put together proposals in all of these areas. There's no hope for that. But what we can do is try to think strategically about opportunities that we do have and put together very credible proposals. Um, some examples that I just don't have time to go into, how we might think about this, is that when we do a proposal, we will have to come up with an idea that in some ways connects back, back to those other levels of the hierarchy within that proposal. Now, if we don't like the fact that the proposal's left out an area that we thought was important, now's the time that we can say there's a niche that you 
forgot about a resource, a sub portfolio you forgot about. We can still get that type of stuff in, but I, I think that you know we're represented so well. Um, not to say that we shouldn't argue for other things, we're represented so well that we already have a lot of territory staked out with respect to this four portfolio. It's just another example of something that I thought of um, in terms of ways that we can do this. So what we have to do as a college is start thinking about how we're going to approach this strategy because between now and October 20th, it's really still the public feedback phase. You get feedback on the report and there are things that are missing. Now is the time to get it in there. Um, and, and so that's the opportunity that we have. Um, but as that's happening, I think we as a college have to start thinking strategically about how we are going to put together our uh, plan in responding to what will eventually be a call for proposals that will have $4 million associated with it. It's already been here in right? So we have an opportunity for funding here that I think is quite significant. Um, there are knowledge platforms that I think we also relate to. So, um, so we have a lot of opportunity here. I think that what I would like to see us do, first of all, if you weren't at the open forum, I know that several people were, but if you didn't go to one of the open forums, I presented at the September 10th one. Other teams will be at the September 16th one where they will talk about this in more detail. I encourage you to do that. It's also live stream if you prefer not to go over there. But I think as this is going on, we need to start crafting a strategy for how to respond to this. So what we want to do, um, first of all, is to start thinking about ways that our programs can connect to that hierarchy of information, the portfolio, sub-portfolio, <coughs> and niches. Um, and then we also have to think about how we can engage in a collaborative proposal with another unit on campus. All proposals have to be multi-unit, meaning across planning units, which are colleges, all right? So it can't just be us, it has to be us with other people. And even better, and in fact it was explicitly kind of implied this during the meeting on, on Tuesday, that we would have external partners would also be a part of that. Maybe that they don't bring funding, but they just bring support for the idea and support of the concept. So we need to start thinking strategically about that. Um, I know that this is going to take some coordination, and so I've asked Hans uh, to be an intake person for generating ideas at this point. So he's gonna help collect information. Um, if you would like to talk to he uh, or anybody else about the uh, even client proposal, uh, for, uh, the report, and you can certainly feel free to do that. But Hodge will start collecting information. And this is something that we want to be informed in at the college office, uh, Michelle and I, uh, but we're not going to be the editors of these. We're not going to be the people that will decide which go forward and which should not go forward. But we do want to make sure that they're good because this is not, a, I mean, we're not going to put together 15 proposals and have 15 funded, right? It's not going to happen. But the quality of the college will be reflected in all 15 of those proposals. So we need to make sure that they're done. So now we going to start looking at the EVA client report and thinking about ways to get into it. Um, I plan on having another open forum just on this topic um, as we get a little bit later in the semester. As we start getting closer to the R&D process, uh, I think it would be a good time for all of us to get back together. Uh, Michelle, would you like to, uh, Michelle got a few announcements about innovation and graduate related things. <laughs>
is one that describes the forms themselves and their use. Um, so uh, this is available as well. And these forms have also been given to um, grad students during uh, grad orientations this past fall. So they're aware of where they can find these forms, etc. Mainly, most of the forms, obviously, that they use are from the grad college. These are our internal forms to keep our process line, etc., and really just clarify who gets copies of what, etc. So no major changes to the forms themselves um, over the past year. Um, the second area um, I wanted to talk about was in the spring. Uh, grad College um, has changed the probation policy for our students. Um, and our grad policy, actually there was no grad policy defined in the grad handbook about the probation period. And they've defined that as a one semester um, probation period for students who fall below a 3.0. Um, that process was enacted in the spring. We're looking at ways to be able to make sure that all of our students can be successful and there's ongoing conversation about whether a two semester plan is allowable and underneath the current policy a two semester strategy um, if a student is not successful and it doesn't look like even with all A's and over that 3.0 mark, um, there is a conversation that happens between the students, the advisor, and myself to lay out a strategy for how they might be able to do it in two semesters. With that strategy, I go to grad college. We both approve that process and allow for that um, student to be able to move forward with the check during that first semester to ensure that even with that, that first semester grade, that one semester probation, that they're actually able to do it. So that process is ongoing. Um, grad College is looking at specific instances and exceptions to that policy for students that are part time, for students that are online, who might not take the full load. So there are some exceptions to that policy. And once that policy is available um, in electronic form, I will send it out along with uh, the documents that I've just handed out to you here. So you have all of that. Um, the other area I want to talk about was faculty research and creative activity. Um, we do, again, this year have fun to be involved in the faculty of research and creative activity. Um, we have a document that is on our website and was distributed last year that remains the same that allows for some travel funds with matching from your college to be able to um, travel and likewise for other larger projects as you might imagine. Um, there's funding for collaborative groups who might be looking at new curriculum. Um, and other types of things and conferences, etc. So I invite you to really take advantage of that opportunity and I'll be sending that document out as well so that you can use those funds. Really, they do are and are depleted on a first-come, first-served basis. So we look at the merit of the proposal, the support from the college itself, and then award those. And so you can imagine probably around February of next year that resource may start to dwindle or become a little tight. So if you have something and you're anticipating a project that won't take place in the spring or travel into the summer before the fiscal year changes, um, please get those proposals in early so that we can evaluate those and uh, award those um, in advance of your travel and the project that you might be working on. Um, the other thing, and Scott touched on this a little bit, since uh, Tim's going to be working in uh, the office working on faculty and creative activity announcements and getting the word out about your work. Um, this past spring, um, we developed a news form. So on the faculty page, on the Scripps College website, there now is a link to a news tips form. There also will be a button on the main page of the Scripps College website for news tips. It's a form that just gives us basic information about what you're working on, etc., so that Tim or Aaron Roberts or someone else in the office can follow up on that work. Um, in addition, uh, we've been working with University Communications and Marketing and hosted uh, this past August a couple of faculty in the room here who participated in a faculty media workshop. Um, for many of us, including myself, who worked on the print side and on the print side behind the scenes, uh, not as comfortable in being in front of the camera for interviews, etc. Um, that training allows you to be able to see yourself and understand a little bit of the process from the media side. For those of us in communication, that might be de rigueur, that's the work that we do, but for some of us, it's still a little odd. So um, if you're interested in those workshops, I'm looking at hosting another one of those in the spring. 
And so we look for a handful of about a half a dozen faculty who might be interested in that. So if that's something that appeals to you and you see that you might have a role in national or local media, whether it's being interviewed for a, re a reporter for a print piece or for video work, um, both are combined into the workshop to help you know your messaging for the media. So if anybody's interested in that, please shoot me an email because we'll be working on that for you this morning. Um, and lastly, um, our innovation work. Uh, the um, innovation work that we're going to be engaging in this year is twofold. One is the Scripps Innovation Challenge, which I'm hoping most folks in the room have already heard of. Um, and a couple of things are going to change with the Scripps Innovation Challenge this year. So let me go ahead and hand out a couple of these on this side of the room. One of the things that's very different for the Scripps Innovation Challenge this year is the fact that we are taking uh, the competition off cycle, which means it will not parallel our semester structure. What will begin immediately this fall, October 30th, and continue through to the beginning of the spring. One of the main reasons for that is because we are scaling this competition internationally and we are adding an additional layer to the scope of the competition to allow other schools to be able to submit their best and brightest team to what we are calling the Innovators Cup. Um, we are going to be involving um, schools that we've worked with in the past, such as some of our potential scholars who we've collaborated with in activities during the summer, as well as schools across the country that have already committed to participate in the process. So right now we have uh, 19 schools who have said they are interested in participating in the Innovators Cup. Um, overall, this is designed to not only lift our brand, but to demonstrate the scope of work around media entrepreneurship and innovation that is happening across the country and around the world. So the competition has on the sheet some of the major dates for the competition. We will have our kickoff on October 30th, um, and it will invite students then to participate in the process. One of the key activities Obviously, if we do not have faculty and others that are doing this within the classroom, and not that it can, but those activities that uh, would be again soon, um, that we're going to be doing our co-working spaces again this year. Last year, we initiated a process outside of the classroom of almost parallel programming to move students through uh, the pieces of the framework for developing a business idea. We're going to be doing that again this year to provide that external out-of-the-classroom experience so um, with those pieces, I'd like to invite, if there are any faculty that would be interested in working with us as a mentor around pieces of uh, development, creativity, video production, et cetera, to help students prepare their entries for the Scripps Innovation Challenge, I'd really invite you to send me an email so that we might find ways to connect you to the Scripps Innovation Challenge process. Um, and lastly, um, we are going to be beginning our conversations around the Innovation Center. This is the Scripps College of Communication Innovation Center. That is not the name that it will have, so that it does not cause confusion with the existing Innovation Center. Um, but we've been having conversations as a college around branding and the conversations that Scott will be leading around our, our vision and mission. And part of that is looking at this new Innovation Center as a way to serve both faculty and students around innovation. And so we'd like to open those conversations up. And the first meeting for that will be on September 18th uh, from 9 to 10 in the morning in Zoom over 103B. Uh, it's room a whole to 20 people or so. And I'm hoping to have several meetings over the course of a couple of weeks. And so if people can't make that meeting, what I plan to do is host two meetings um, on similar topics so that if you can't make the first one, you might make the second one. The one on September 18th will be focusing on, on SWOT analysis and environmental scan of what we see we need as, as faculty and students at the college and looking at what other competing institutions are doing and seeing how we might be able to position ourselves in the school in a way to be able to leverage the best of what we have here at Ohio. Yes? Can you repeat that time? Sure. So the Innovation Center meeting is September 18th, 9 to 10 a.m., Schoonover 103B. And the focus will be around uh, SWOT analysis and environmental standards where we are right now. Any questions on any of those topics? Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle.
representative for faculty sitting to the college. And so he started learning about uh, as much as one can um, about RCM and will continue to do so. But as you have RCM questions, he is one of the outlets. Of course, you can also feel free to talk to a school director or myself. The second thing is just the overall news about RCM. Our revenue went up by about $2 million last year as a college. Now, I would love to be able to tell you that's because of you know, some specific initiative that we did. The reality is our initiatives, because of a three-year rolling average, won't start to really see increases in revenue for another year or so. But the state subsidy formula and the way that it changed is what really boosted that $2 million revenue. There were some things that we did that impacted it, but about a million of that $2 million was just the governor deciding to change the state subsidy formula, which very much benefited our college. And so that was good news. <clears throat> our expenses went up by about $1 million. Now, those expenses can be subdivided into direct expenses and indirect expenses. Our indirect expenses did account for some of that because we all got salary increases. We hired a few people and things like that. So there were some increases in direct expenses. But the majority of our $1 million expense increase happened as a result of indirect expenses, i.e. the tax that we pay back to the university. So one of the things that I asked Austin to do as a faculty senator is to keep and continue asking the question about what the right size of the administrative budget should be and how it's charged to the units, and that's what the deans are doing as well. And I, I hope that as all of us ask that question, that we will start to um, uh, get, get some sort of a fix on where we can calibrate those indirect costs um, so that they will be fair in creating for us the university that we want, you know, sort of at the center and, the, and then the periphery of the of the OIT and that sort of thing, but also giving us the money that we need as a college to operate. But I feel really good about where we're at in terms of RCM. We improved as a college last year, and I think that's the big takeaway. I want to end on a positive note, um, which is going to be Beth telling us about a new initiative that we did start this year that's still very much in its infancy stage, but I think has a very significant potential for the college. So very quickly, because it's Friday, 5.5. Um, so Brittany Peterson and I, Brittany is director of online learning for the college and a professor and health, um, have been working with the online degree completion plan. If you're not aware, that plan was finally approved in uh, late April of this past year, um, which gave us until June 10th, which was the deadline to recruit for fall. Um, and we were told by admissions to maybe expect two students because that was way too short of a time to recruit and we have seven. So we have seven students in the fall cohort. Um, between them all, they're averaging nine credit hours, so not too bad. Um, most of them are in Ohio. We stole some from the engineering online degree completion plan. Um, but we do have one in Hong Kong who works at the American consulate and one who's in another state that I can't currently remember. Um, so we are recruiting now for spring. Um, we're told by um, admissions that we need to be very careful because they're afraid that if um, word gets out too quickly that there will be an onslaught because they see this as being a very positive um, bachelor's degree completion plan and the way that we've set up the requirements and the way that um, students can use this in their careers in a very different applied way than what they're normally seeing in um, these kinds of programs. So we're very excited about that. Great job. It's exciting to see that come to fruition. In fact, it was officially approved by the Board of Regents as of today. So, so, so we won't talk about the courses that we taught before that official. All right. I apologize that I ran just a bit longer than I thought. Um, I'm free until 5 o'clock, so if there are questions that you'd like to ask, I'm happy to stick around. Uh, but I do want to thank you for being here. Uh, and there's going to be some additional forums that I'm planning on having on things related to innovation. I think having one on assessment um, as we start to finalize those plans uh, and some other topics like that as the semester rolls along. But I also recognize that that's a drain on time. So try to make them very focused so that you can decide whether they're in your bailiwick or not and if you want to come. So again, thank you for your attention.